we we begin. Uh, let's see, my yes, my thought says we definitely should begin <laughs> um, with uh, Professor Daniela Stefanovic, who has, among other things, already given me one more female ruler of whom I was ignorant beforehand. Thank you very much. Moments for getting this. It's all. It's really challenging to talk after wonderful presentation we had yesterday and today. But I'll do my best. And well, it's hard to pack everything within the 15 minutes. But I will provide you with a little bit of data and put few ideas, hoping this will provoke a discussion. So. Okay. Uh, uh, can I have a bit of help? I'm not seeing how to put it. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to Egypt. The institution of kingship in ancient Egypt was a male institution, deeply rooted in the cycle of Osiris, with the male being identified as a male falcon god Horus during his life and as a male god Osiris during his death. The king was also the son of god Re, being a god himself only insofar as there was no intermediate term between human and god, to simplify, the ruler was a link between world of humans and realm of gods. Being so, a king maintained order or mat by defeating chaos or isfet and was himself a manifestation of God on earth. The institution of queenship or Hemet Nesut Veret was complementary to the one of the kingship. Well, it's interesting to see how the issue of queenship was solved, for example, during the reign of Hatshepsut and the one could not exist without the other. The position of the queen was also rooted in mythology and divine world, as the queens played important rituals themselves. However, the institution of kingship, let's say it metaphorically, sometimes used to be confronted with a serious problem. How to comply with human earthly existence of the ruler, in fact, with the biological sex of the ruler, I'm deliberately avoiding the term gender. In fact, how to resolve the issue of female horse? The long history of ancient Egypt has witnessed four female monarchs. Sobek Neferu, the hero of our story, Hatshepsut, well, let's say beginning or mid of the 15th century BC, Tausert, beginning of the 12th century BC, and Cleopatra VII, 1st century BC. Sobek Neferu, also, Neferu Sobek, by some scholars, was the daughter of Amenemhet III and Ada, the sister or stepsister of Amenemhet IV, the last ruler of the 12th dynasty. The relationship between Sobek Neferu and her immediate successor, in fact, the first ruler of the 13th dynasty, and the way in which she assumed the throne remain unknown. Simply, no contemporary epigraphic evidence provides information as to her successor and also by means by which she attained the throne. However, she is the first female monarch in ancient Egypt who is named in contemporary king list. She is included in Manetho's king list, appearing as Semiophris, the Turin king list, uh, and the Karnak and Saqqara king list. The Turin canon records that her reign lasted three years, ten months, and twenty-four days. All out, Sobek Neferu reign uh, has been rather short. She is known from at least 25 artifacts, including papyrus, carabs, cylinder seals, a bad stila, and also a graffito in Kuma, Nubian fortress, present day Sudan, recording the level of the inundation at 1.83 meter during her third regnal year, collaborating with the data uh, provided by uh, Turin Cannon. Her name, which means beauty of Sobek, refers to the crocodile god Sobek, and Sobek Neferu was the first of at least eight other pharaohs who would uh, later link themselves with the god variously associated with pharaonic power, the Nile, military bravery, and fertility. In demonstrating her association with the god, she continued 
the upward shift of the god statues that her father and grandfather had instigated. Of special importance are her building sites and statues. Uh, sorry, unfortunately, most of them fragmentary preserved or presently inaccessible. She associated uh, herself with building, building projects at Havara, Haraga, Hierakompolis Magna, and Tel El Daba. For example, several inscriptions naming Sobek Neferu were discovered at the Temple of Herishef in Hierakompolis Magna, thus indicating that she had building projects at the site, perhaps again completing the construction started by her father, Amenemhet III, and her uh, famous grandfather Senuser III to securing a personal legacy in a way. At the site of Havara, she deliberately emphasized her relationship, or someone did uh, this for herself, to her father continuing the work on the mortuary temple, perhaps in order to legitimize her own reign. Partly preserved statue of Sobek Neferu, now in the collection of Louvre, addresses the issue of this paper, whether or not she was fit to rule. The statue was brought by the Louvre in 1973, but its provenance is unknown. The object is life-size or a little larger, while well, remaining portion is 48 centimeter high, but when complete, the statue would have been approximately 1.6 meter high. Her lower statue is anatomically female, no doubt, but combined both female and male garb. For example, over a high-waisted shift dress, there is a royal wraparound kilt uh, with a starched triangular panel in the front. Again, part of the Nemes headdress, the royal headdress, can be seen on her shoulders and it's tight in the back. And she also wears a leather chest pouch pendant resembling that of the earlier 12th dynasty rulers. Previously, the Nemes headdress has been associated only with male rulers. Well, to be honest, all depictions of rulers before Sobek Neferu were men. We just do not know. Perhaps there was someone else. Likewise, the chest pouch pendant uh, was, again, only worn by men. Well, one way or another, she was the first royal woman with the public image uh, incorporating both masculine and feminine elements. And another important point, well, the photo is not very good, but there is a tiny inscription on her belt saying or naming her as Sat Net Hat. I would guess there is a tiny F saying the daughter of his body, either of her, of her father or of the god, but she is clearly indicated as a female. Another piece of statuary in the repertoire of the monuments for Sobek Neferu also deserves special attention. This is a small dark green chest figurine of a woman in a cloak in the collection of Metropolitan Museum. This fine but damaged statuette represents a woman wearing a half-set cloak. This is very important because the Hepset is a ceremony that celebrated the continued rule of a pharaoh, from which one had emerged and rest on her right breast. The style of the piece is typical, a male cloaked figurines from the 12th and 13th dynasty. While the representation is typically masculine, well, the statue is clearly the representation of woman. Most importantly, this is the only known example of a female ruler wearing a hepset garment in the entire pharaonic history. The gender ambiguity of Sobek Neferu rule is also associated in the various inscriptions that invoke her royal titles. Abed, likely from Fayum, calls her King of Appa and Lower Egypt, as does an inscription of, uh, on a seal located in the Cairo Museum. She is referred to variously both as a son and daughter of Re. Here is, uh, she is the daughter of Re. Sometimes her golden Horus name was generated male as this gender switch sometimes even occurs on the same object. Uh, for example, as is the case of the inscription that calls her the female Horus, Lord of the Action. However, her official titulary clearly uh, illustrates that she was sanctioned by the gods. A blue glazed cylinder seal in the collection of the British Museum records four of her five royal names. She who is beloved of Sobek of Shedet, King of Appa and Lower Egypt, Sobek Neferu Shedeti, may she live the two ladies, daughter of power, 
Lady of the Two Lands, Horus of Gold, she whose appearance is stable, the female Horus, she who is beloved of Re. A fragmentary relief from the complex of her father, Amenemhet III, at Hapara, shows the Serech of that king adjacent to the Serech of Nober, no, uh, Sobek Neferu, mentioning again her as a female Horus, as we can see here clearly. The topics of um, gender fluidity or male-female binary, female masculinity, referring to the female adaptation of traditionally viewed masculine behaviors, have been in focus of many Egyptologists pointing out, well, I would just mention one recent paper quoting that Sobek Neferu subscribed to the traditional vision of kinship but was limited by her female body. And I'm asking, how do we know this? However, if we leave aside a gender theory, stricto senso, which is extremely important, but sometimes we are a bit overwhelmed with this, and turn to the royal dogma as attested in the written and iconographic sources, Sobek Neferu's story may look a bit different. Choose. When we find her depicted as a woman with a royal regalia, or as a king with or without Nemes in feminine form, we should not think firstly, I would dare to say, about how this changed herself. Gender identity, because due to her gender, she, she would not be fit to rule, but more by our standards than by ancient Egyptian dogma, but if and how this change in her representations was related to other actors, ancestors, contemporaries, and gods. In fact, what she has to do is to comply with established rules of the quorum. As Professor Baines has shown, the Egyptian representations were ordered by the quorum, quoting, a set of rules and practices defining what may be represented picturally with captions displayed and possibly written down in which context and in what form, end of quotation and another quotation, and was probably based ultimately, uh, ultimately on rules and practices of conduct and etiquette or spatial separation and religious avoidance, end of quotation. The most important evidence I think that Sobek Neferu ruled as a female pharaoh and that she was a female king. However, a cylinder seal that is inscribed with her royal names. The seal uses a male horus for her golden name, but other names are um, absolutely feminine, potentially demonstrating, I would dare to say, the genderless office of the king. Well, we know from Egyptian sources that there is no one else as a king, and being so, the earthly existence of the ruler may change or adapt to his divine office. Just one example. King does not have a brother. It's well known that the royal families were numerous, but not in a single case the title king's brother have ever been attested throughout dynastic history. Simply, following dogma and the quorum after accession the throne, all biological brothers of the king titulary becomes king's son. And we know explicitly two examples from the 13th dynasty confirmed by the name that before the brother become kings, they've been yeah, uh, brothers, but when the person become the king, they are just becoming his sons. The mandatory duties a uh, ruler had to perform for the pharaonic position were not restricted, I would say, or shaped to a biological reality, including a certain sex. And Sobek Neferu iconography expresses these profound meanings that were illustrated for a monarch who happened to be a female. Her, right, her reign proves that each pharaoh has expected to conduct the same functions and be represented in the same iconography, regardless of their gender or sex. Thank you very much. Um, I would think I, I think we will pause the questions and continue um, in the order that we have on the program which means that it is now the
turn of um, Professor Mariana Miskic um, to tell us, to move us to Roman history uh, for a few moments. Thank you. I'm online. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. <laughs> okay, I will start now. Uh, one of the most controversial personalities of imperial Rome is certainly Agrippina the Younger. Agri uh, she's historically known as the mother of Emperor Nero, the wife of her uncle Claudius, sister of Caligula, and the daughter of Germanicus. In addition to these recognizable roles by which uh, Roman patriarchal society identified her, Agrippina was an example of an ambitious and a scrupulous woman. She was an extraordinary woman with this incredible perseverance and devotion to one goal, the rule of the Roman state. If she could not personally occupy the Roman throne, uh, she um, found alternative ways to stay to the close, uh, to, to stay close to the throne and governs from the shadow. So Agrippina's unwelcome intrusion into spheres where women uh, by law and custom would not be welcomed was treated harshly by the sources. The main witnesses to Agrippina's life are the Tacitus Annals. Uh, Tacitus described her power as absolute, but also cleverly directed. According to the statements placed in the book, it, uh, it could be presumed that Agrippina uh, would be an excellent choice for an emperor, at least better than her brother Caligula or her uncle Claudius, if only she had been a man. Uh, in order to correctly perceive the uniqueness and uh, specificity of Agrippina's personality, it is necessary to look at it and in the context of the general position of women in Roman society. The Roman tradition occasionally uh, places women in position um, of heroes at crucial moment for the uh, Roman state. For example, Sabine women who interceded between their new Roman husbands and their former families to, uh, um, to form a life, alliance between them. So more common role of the woman is protective uh, with blind obedience to restrictive honor bound patriarchal society. As contrast to the general expectation placed on the Roman matron, Agrippina breaks down all moral and legal barriers in order to achieve political goals. Agrippina was destined to rule by her noble origin. She was born from father Germanicus and mother Agrippina the Elder, combining the blood of Julian and Claudian dynasties. Uh, Germanicus was Roman general and he was adopted by his uh, paternal uncle, Tiberius, who succeeded Augustus as Roman emperor a decade later. Germanicus' popularity grew with war successes in Germania, which further strengthened Tiberius' distrust. Tiberius actually blamed Agrippina, for, uh, Agrippina the Elder for the Germanic's popularity among the army, who was present and decisive in suppressing the military rebellion. I will here make some dig digression from the course of the events, just to, to uh, mention the Oratio of Severus Zecchina. That censor proposed in the Senate to prohibit magistrates from taking their wives uh, with them to work in the provinces. He refers to the conservative Republican custom of not taking women on visits to allies and foreign nations. He argues that woman has no place in war, because she can influence uh, the army with her fear and disturb the peace with her beauty and luxury. Although this moral note was uh, dismissed as inappropriate and outdated, it explained that position of woman in Roman high society quite well. The fear of woman ruling from the shadow was widespread. So it is believed that women should be kept, uh, kept under control because of their temper, because if they are left to their own devices, they become cruel, troublesome, and greedy for possessions. Comparing them with men, Tacitus says that women orders are more persistent and despotic. On the contrary, the desirable female virtues were chastity, uh, Roman castitas, and modesty. Castitas is a general determinant of morality that every Roman matron should possess, as autoritas was eminent for the patripamilias. 
Okay, to go back to the course of the event, so uh, Germanicus' early death under suspicious conditions stopped his further career advancement. So uh, uh, Agrippina was uh, not satisfied with this partially investigated um, uh, conspiracy. And uh, reading the annals, uh, inevitable impression is that Agrippina resented the ruler more than her husband. So uh, Tacitus records alleged poisoning attempts to Agrippina and open letters from the Senate where Agrippina is reproached for the insolence of the tongue and defiance of the soul. Um, and of Agrippina the Elder is quite unclear. Uh, it is not certain whether she committed suicide by starvation or she was deprived of the food. <laughs> In the end, the result is the same, but uh, the most uh, possibility is much more likely. So uh, in the inglorious fate of uh, her proud mother certainly deeply influenced and shaped Agrippina as a person. She was fully aware that without male support, she could not survive, even less succeed in high political circles. Her first husband, Domitius Echinobarbus, was her paternal first cousin from a distinguished family of Julian. While Suetonius described him as a man detestable in every aspect of his life, so uh, there is no uh, much testimony about their marriage. In this respect, one sentence can be indicative. Shortly after the birth of, his, of their son Nero, while receiving the congratulations, he commented that nothing born of Agrippina and himself could be anything but detestable and a public evil. So these words were prophetic indeed. Uh, when uh, Agrippina's brother Caligula uh, become an emperor, uh, she received some honors, including but not limiting to the rights of Vestal virgins, such as freedom to view public games from the upper seats. She also has been honored together with her sisters with a new type of coinage, depicting images of Caligula and his sisters on opposite faces. He also having their names added to the motions, including loyalty oaths. Uh, after Caligula's short and scandalous reign, Agrippina was returned from exile and she became a, a most serious candidate for the ruler's wife. Agrippina had already managed to emotionally charm her uncle, but he was not ready to present the precedent of marriage between uh, uh, uncle and the niece. So Agrippina managed to convince the Senate through the censor Vitellius that the marriage of um, that their marriage would be the best option. The speech of the cunning Vitellius won over the Senate crowd so much that they immediately passed a law allowing marriage in the third degree of kinship. From that moment, it was more than clear who was the actual emperor. Agrippina wisely manipulated Claudius and presented her decisions and opinions to him as his own. Her decision to return Seneca from exile and appoint him as a praetor and later uh, the, as the nearest teacher uh, had, a, uh, had a, a goal to strengthen Nero's position as a future leader. For this, this purpose, Claudius adopted Nero, even though he had his own legitimate heir from his marriage to Messalina. Another important step was Nero's betrothal to Octavia, Claudius' daughter. With this act, Nero completely equalized with Britannicus as a candidate for the ruling position. So uh, when it comes to power and authority, Agrippina was unstoppable. Um, she wanted to assert her authority both internally and externally in order to exalt herself in her power and call upon her illustrious origin, she took the title of Augusta. She wanted to let the Roman people and the Senate know that she was not just another ruler's wife, although it was clear from the, uh, from the beginning because Tacitus testifies that her marriage to Claudius brought about an upheaval in the state. Tacitus evaluates her rule as a streak like that of the man. Her appearance in public was assessed as serious, without licentiousness, with a touch of arrogance. She gave herself the right to enter the capital in a cover to cart like priests and statues of rulers in the olden times. With such symbolism, she increased respect and reputation because no woman of the Roman emperor was the 
At the same time, the daughter of the pretender to the throne, sister, wife, and the mother of emperor. Uh, although Cl Claudius very obediently carried out Agrippina's ideas and eliminated the opponents in the way she imagined it, uh, Agrippina sensed that her end could be near and very um, resembled to the end of her predecessors, Messalina, and decided to act faster. So she took the opportunity and poisoned Claudius before uh, he appointed his son Britannicus as the heir to the throne. So um, she managed to bring Nero to the uh, throne with unscrupulous bribes and deceptions. Although Agrippina had decisive influence on Nero coming to power, she did not think of taking the throne herself. Uh, the omission to um, take the throne, even though she was the closest blood relative and with obvious proven qualities as a ruler, is the general belief that women cannot and should not be the rulers. This patriarchal principle was still alive in the minds of Roman, although the other patriarchal virtues had disappeared a long time ago. Um, although Nero's taking the throne was the fulfillment of Agrippina's goal, it was only then that problems arose. Uh, Agrippina resented her son abandonment the most and that he uh, did not give her suitable place in administration of the state. Uh, here, uh, sources are divided because Vetonius says that um, a Nero confined to Agrippina uh, management of the public and uh, private affairs, but uh, Tacitus does not mention it, so it is not clear, but the, her satisfaction was so great that she went from being her son's greatest ally to his enemy, claiming that the throne should be returned to the rightful heir, Britannicus. So uh, by reminding her of the existence of legitimate heir, she awakened the fear in Nero that forced him to commit a crime. Um, although his accession to the throne was confirmed by many crimes, he did not personally commit them. The murder of Britannicus was carried out in extremely open and brutal manner so that it was clear to everyone who ordered it. Agrippina herself experienced the greatest fear. She saw in her son's action that he was ready for matricide. So uh, he actually tried several times, but she uh, managed skillfully to avoid the trap. But in the end, he um, succeeded in his intentions. Also, uh, it is important to mention one thing. Sources are also divided on the issue of the incest between Agrippina and Nero. Some believe that it was initiated by the Agrippina, uh, that is for Tacitus, another that it was initiated by Nero Suetonius, but certainly in the end they uh, agreed that there was definitely one. So uh, this conflicted relationship eventually ended in matricide. The reason why Nero decided to kill is not completely clear. One of the reasons is that she was preventing his wedding with the freed Popea. Another possible reason is that he himself was afraid that capable Agrippina would observe the throne from him. The third reason is their unresolved incestuous emotional relationship. Aside from the pathological relationship between mother and son, Nero feared that Agrippina would take the throne from him as the way she had given him. I think it is the most probable. So the matricide committed against Agrippina went unnoticed uh, without sanction. More precisely, Nero carved out the mother's murder by suicide, according to which Agrippina was preparing to rebel. Allegedly, she took her own life and she saw that she could not carry out the rebellion. Neither the pe uh, people nor the Senate believed the Nero, but uh, no one actually pitied excessively for Agrippina, remembering her uh, despotic behavior and licentiousness. Her violent death was justified by her bad reputation, and it was especially stated that she was a woman who dared to trample the Senate. So one cannot help but wonder if the violent death of the ruler's father would be viewed in this way. So in the end, some conclusions. So looking in the general, one gets impressions that uh, Agrippina's biggest sin and obstacle was being a woman, but it was also her, great, uh, the, her advantage. Uh, she used it in a very good, uh, not 
it is not good word to say good way, but she used it very well. Uh, compared to her, to her contemporaries, her morals were no less than theirs, who also enjoyed the bushery incest and her homosexuality. Also, um, well, uh, reading the annals, um, we come across a general statement that women have no place in the public sphere. However, Agrippina succeeded to gain that position and preserving it for a significant period of time. Having in mind that women in Roman imperial time did not even have full legal capacity, the influence and importance of powerful women like Agrippina is even more prominent. So um, on the other hand, Agrippina consciously used her feminine charms to compensate for her lack of political rights. She was not just another, but we must um, mention that she was not just another vicious woman and does not deserve the general condemnation she experienced both in uh, sources and in later literature. So leaving aside her morals and modus acquirendi of her political success, her achievement is admirable. Uh, having in mind that imperial Rome did not rely on patriarchal values at all, but women's uh, women, um, life strictly had to be in accordance with them. This is where the main misconception about Agrippina begins and it is maintained. Agrippina's personality is seen exclusively in the light of her moral virtues, which she did not possess at all. In contrast, she was unscrupulous, ambitious, and promiscuous. Augustus' legislation prescribed what was expected of women of that time, to marry and give birth at least to three children. Agrippina was a, a woman of extraordinary energy who was not devoted to family life and childbirth. So she was politically ambitious woman in monarchical system where women were not allowed. So to understand Agrippina, first we must understand the system that shaped her. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> It is the end. <laughs> and uh, uh, do we have any questions for her right now? Well, if she's staying, we can have the questions in the end. Are you staying till the end of the session? Yes. We can have them at okay. the end. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll postpone it then. Thank you. That means we should move on and try to have some little space for the questions. Um, so it's now time to move to late 15th century, early 16th century France, one of my favorite rooms. And so I wish us all to welcome Dr. Melina Recoy to um, talk about Queen Moncon and uh, Le Roi. Um, Marguerite of Beaufort and Anne of France, also Anne of Brittany, I believe, in my book. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, does it work? So, what I'll be talking today, I'll be talking about two cases of Marguerite Beaufort and Anne of France. Uh, they were pretty much quibbles. And they are interesting to the studies pertaining to gender as a factor bearing from the ascending to the trend, rendering the female unfit to rule. The cases of these two 15th century noble ladies of royal descent demonstrate that this unfitness for the authority of Queen Regnant, or even for the official regent, was caused either by practice or by legally binding norms, although admittedly of the new origin, as will be seen that it was the case in France. Uh, I'll start with Margaret Beaufort and I'll just say a bit about her. Basically, she was not barred from ascending the English throne by legal barriers. However, the prece precedence was against her. Margaret was one of the main female participants of the 15th century dynastic struggle known as the Wars of the Roses, for those who are not familiar with the 15th century history, European history. She, mm -hmm. was, she entered the active grapple for the English crown late in the struggle, and not in her own name but that of her, in that of her son, Henry Tudor. She was also a Lancaster noblewoman, but Lady Margaret uh, had as much right to the English throne as, for example, mm. uh, the Yorkist Edward uh, IV, as she was Edward III's great-great-granddaughter by his son, John of Gaunt, who in turn had Margaret's uh, grandfather out of wedlock, but uh, legitimized him at the first opportunity. 
However, there were several factors that influenced her not to, claim, uh, not to claim train for herself. We can say that precedence was one of them, but not only. Her position and her choices can also be understood by pointing out previous examples where women tried to claim the throne for themselves. Um, most notably, notably, we should uh, mention Empress Matilda, uh, daughter of Henry I in 12th century. The unsuccessful claim of 12th century Empress Matilda was not disputed by her contemporaries on the basis of her sex, nor the contemporary thought precluded women from sovereignty, establishing a situation that may be viewed as a mere practical inconvenience. The connection of the principles in the Anglo-Saxon inheritance, which was also accepted by the Norman conquerors until the 13th century, uh, with inheritance in the case of royal, in the case of the royal inheritance, can be visible. In this later case, uh, it can be pointed out that the inheritance of property has become tied to the transfer of sovereignty, resulting in the understanding that the heiress to the kingdom is essentially a womb that could be basically um, traded. She is making her reproduction a hereditary commodity. It has been argued that this principle, where female heiress essentially transfer her hereditary rights to the crown that descended from their fathers to their male descendants, was applied from the normal conquests to the late Middle Ages in England. The existence of such principle is important when it comes to female pretender to the throne, uh, to the legitimate right to rule in moments of the dynastic crisis caused by the non-functioning of the patrilinear inheritance system. Although claimed that this principle was repeated until the end of the 15th century in cases where there was a disruption of patrilineal system of royal succession, it should be highlighted that there were cases when the above-mentioned principle was wanted to turn into principle of primogeniture succession to the throne with the inclusion of women through the legitimization of the succession through the legitimation, re legitimation of the succession of the Norman conquest. This was precisely actually the case of Henry I, who created and worked to implement the plan to make his daughter and surviving married child Matilda heir to the English throne. His plan failed for a number of reasons, but it had two, con uh, two consequences as the results. It set a precedent for subsequent claimants to the English throne, and the failure enabled the continuation of the aforementioned principle on his grandson, Henry II, who established his right to the kingship on the rights of his mother, Matilda, to pass the royal right to the throne from her father to the next male heir. Female rule where power and authority intersect uh, could essentially only be possible when such structures have momentarily collapsed. In other words, only to some extent with the non-functioning of the patriarchy were women in a position to demand the realization of their rights, not only to the element of power, but also to the more, more important element of the authority that constituted the concept of a ruler. This kind of development can be considered true in all cases where women manage to achieve the right they claim to, to rule and sit in the English or in the medieval England. More common, however, was, um, how to say, a, 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 an influence, not to say a rule, but uh, influence and, and, and exercise of power without the authority of a female, of a woman, a consort, a helpmate um, to a male ruler. A woman exercising royal authority on behalf of her relatives was nothing new in English history, even when uh, Matilda claimed the train, because it was practiced among Saxon and Norman queens before her, and not even during the period of the Wars of the Roses, later, during Margaret before times. First of all, uh, maybe it should be mentioned here that the mother of Empress Matilda herself occasionally exercised power through, during the reign of her, her father, Henry I. The famous English queen, uh, Emma, held power for several decades at the beginning of the 11th century based on her kinship with the male power holders. However, until the 16th century, uh, the Tudor queens, and as we have seen in uh, the 17th century, Stuart queens, the female inclusive system of primogeniture, started at the initiative of Henry I, did not take root even during the dynastic upheavals caused by the overthrow of Richard II at the end of the 14th century, nor uh, in the 15th century dynastic wars. Uh, furthermore, Margaret Beaufort had um, 
how to say, a negative uh, example in, in among her contemporaries in, let's say, the most recent history in the, in the, in the forum and in the present of uh, Henry VI, uh, French Queen Margaret of Anjou, uh, where the idea is about female acquiring, exercising power uh, have changed from, uh, from, the, from the 12th century. And her perception of the of the of the French imposter and the woman kind of worked against her. So at that point, coming after the Lancastrian uh, defeat, uh, started her struggle for for Henry's crown after Edward of Lancaster, Margaret of Anjou were defeated. Uh, Lady Margaret before understood that she has to kind of change uh, the, the way she would claim, uh, claim the power. So Margaret before decided to struggle for the throne in her son's name, which is similar to the precedent set in the case of Empress Matilda. Her place in the succession was basically overlooked, so she became, as it's known as Queen Mancom, when her son became the king. The 15th century political crisis that resulted in three decades of the Nicene War, in fact, raised the question of women's place in the royal succession. As a precedence for the succession of women to the throne of England and for her success as a queen, the example of Matilda thus did not make a strong or clear case in the 15th century. Her contemporaries did not dispute a woman's rights to claim to the throne. Matilda was not excluded from the success because she was a woman. John of Salisbury, in his late, uh, in his later Polycarticus, does not argue that women should be excluded from sovereignty. Merely that because of the inherent weakness of her sex, a female ruler must struggle to maintain her virtue. Even so, her weak nature does not preclude her from exercising sovereignty. However, two and a half uh, centuries later, when Lady Margaret's son, Henry Tudor, defeated Richard III at the Battle of Bosford, there was no established law defining English succession. Across the Channel, Anne of France was banned from assessing the trend by legally binding disqualification the early 15th century juridic product that later became known as the Salic Law. It resulted in barren women from governance was foreseen by social critic, none other than another woman, Christine de Pizan, in the debate with its constructor, Montreuil, in the early 15th century, and she countered it, pointing out the lack of customary law forbidding female governance in France. However, Anne of France governed France for a number of years uh, in, the, in late 15th century as the regent during her brother's minority and even after his marriage to Anne of Brittany. Anne of France, known that was maybe as Anne of Beaujau or Anne of Bourbon, was des designated by her father Louis XI to become her younger brother Charles VIII's caretaker. That was a term used, however, she was de facto his guardian and at least a non-designated regent. When in 1482, Louis XI withdrew to live in the royal castle in Turin, due to his increasingly declining health, he bestowed the title of the Lieutenant General on Pierre de Bourgeois, his son-in-law, whilst Anne was to guide and to take care of heir and her younger brother Charles. Despite the king's words, the moment he died, Anne had forced to face challenge to her official title of the Guardian and to take that of an official region caused by Louis, the Duke of Orleans. It is in these first days after the death of Louis XI that Anne's reactions reflect the advice she gives in her manual, by the way. Anne's biographer, Jehan d'Orliac, stated that she acted in guardianship of her brother, in obedience to her husband, and in alliance with her sister, presenting herself as a guardian and a woman who fulfilled all the essential categories of support, thus appearing to, pay, to obey the tradition. As she advised Suzanne, her daughter, in The Lessons to Her Daughter, her manual, the appearance was everything. She stresses humility to her husband and the pure importance of an alliance. And succeeding to hide behind the mask of formality of the guardian of a royal ward. Anne's actions were, however, understood by the aristocracy as a breach of male privilege without some form of a precedent. There is a divergent opinion in historiography whether Charlotte of Savoy, the Dodger Queen, would have been more easily accepted as the regent for Charles VIII having the tradition as invisible genealogical chain, the wife of one king and the mother of the next, whereas Anne, in her role of a sister, had no tradition to support her claim of power outside of the official title. Anne of France, as a regent, aimed to keep her younger 13-year-old Charles uh, VIII on the throne and not in install him on the throne, as was the case with Margaret before and her son. 
Nevertheless, the case of um, the bourgeois and the France is not a classic example of female regency, and it was no, not without formal defects or deficiencies in custom. Anne of France, namely, was neither queen nor the queen consort, the king's wife. These circumstances was not only a problem and had to face, as her regency was sometimes described and in a coin phase, like a truncated regency, for example. As their father, Louis XI, no one designated Anne, actually, as the regent. And this should not be understood as an oversight by the sea king, but rather as a result of the precedent, which should not have a formally and legally made Anne de facto, should not make her, I would say, de facto regency more difficult than it already was supposed that it would have been. Namely, the problem also arose from the interpretation of the king's coming of age, where the, in the event the king Charles, the, Charles VIII was not considered of age, at the age of 14, the regency would have gone to the man, the first prince by blood, which was Louis of Orleans. Interpreting that he was of age, but young or infirm, the king was given a guardian of royal blood, a de facto regent who had always been the king mother until then. But in the case of Charles VIII, his father appointed his elder sister as a guardian. All the 14th century ordinance made a distinction between the function of the guardian who takes care of the education of young king and the regent who rules during that period. Even then, probably from the earlier cases, there was a tacit understanding that the one who takes care of the personality of the minor, king on the burden of a lawyer power, also falls on him. The nature of her regency caused her contemporaries, as well as later historians, to see the main characteristic of her activities in inv invisibility, where Anne of France took care to disguise her power as much as others tried to parade it. But it seems that she still did not succeed completely in that if they considered that during the eight years of unofficial regency, she became not only de facto regent, but also de facto king of France. France had a continu uh, continuous tradition of female regency. The earliest examples represented the hoc solutions to urgent situations. Ever since the regency, however, Louis uh, of Savoy, and um, later in, in the 16th century, however, the queen mother came, be, came to be the first choice among the possible regions, with female regency achieving a quasi-institutional status under Catherine Medici, Marie de Medici, and an old Anne of Austria in the 17th century. Scholars tracking the evolution of this phenomenon have argued that it was made possible by the Salic law, that is, the exclusion in France of women from the throne, the queen mother was a safe regent because she was unable to succeed, and therefore as a we need to mention the importance of the ordinance from the beginning of the 15th century of 1403, abolishing a separate, re like a separate region to the advantage of the Queen Mother. Basically, the ordinance of Charles VI stipulated that the young king would succeed no matter what his age without the aid of a regent, liberating the Queen Mother from the surveillance of a male governor. As guardian of her son, the Queen Mother could rule through him until he was capable of ruling himself. True, the ordinance decreed that the queen would be assisting her task by a college or advisors, but the strong and competent woman could effectively rule the kingdom under such circumstances. The regency of Louise of Savoy in the 16th century after Anne of France can be seen as different from that of one of Anne's predecessors in this role, Isabel of Bavaria, which is not supported by the dynastic notions of lineages and blood ties found in feudal law codes. The regencies of Isabel and Anne, like those of the later Queen Mothers, were constructed explicitly on their exclusion from the throne and their ability to rule through the king. How this helped Anne of France to become the fact the fact of regent without authority of France, we can also see uh, from the intellectual climate that led into the creation of the so-called Salic laws uh, that the Europe barred women from sending the French trade. The 15th and 16th century were well known for pictorial works pertaining to power, women, women's disability or ability to hold power and the most desirable female behavior, and particularly to the incompatibility between the power and authority and the female sex. These writings constituted the Creole de Femme, whilst the majority of the authors were men, some were women, who commenced participating in the discussion, negotiating boundaries of, of its use by their sex. The two, two most famous women of the era who took part in the debate were Christine de Pizan and Anne of France herself. Christine de Pizan was already a well-known courtly poet of the lost verses when entered the discussion in the issues of women, centered on their ability to rule and on the so-called Salic law. 
in this intervention that rendered her famous, in her literary intercession of the tradition of the ancient and medieval male writers who had talked of the female and its natural aspects, the Pisan criticized severely the urge to defame women and the feminine. Christine entered the so-called uh, Querel de Femme with her famous book, known shortly as The City of Ladies, writing against historical and contemporary misogynistic narrative, such as Aristotle and Ovid even known and Matelus, as well as the contemporary supporter Montreuil, exposing their defaming stance against women and their intellectual and moral capacities. She, in this way, she uh, denounced it by employing it a method of exemplar, which is quite, how to say, often uh, the way uh, it was written in, uh, in the 15th and 16th century. She named women of the distant past and her as well as her contemporaries who had proved that they had governing abilities. Christine attacked general and natural and social, arguing that women could be taught and readied for office should they be called and invested with authority because women had demonstrated a natural sense for politics and government abroad and at home. She understood how her actions were necessary to diminish consequences of moral defamation of women and its social implications in the future for any possibility of women's political participation. Studies concerning what became to known the Salic law and the Pisan's answer to the, its constructor, Montreuil, can be viewed as the opening phase of political debate about barring women from governance. The Salic law is explained as a product of two juridical frameworks that aided the creation of political identity. On the one hand, the early development of the national consciousness and the establishment of a public realm throughout the 13th, 15th century, and on the other, the contested uh, processes through which political identity was culturally configured in late medieval and early modern France. This further reveals the interplay between the combined forces of defamation that deduced moral certainty and legal evidence fabricated to conform to moral certainty that was, creation, that was created in the early 15th century and its power to construct the Salic law. Within this reality, Christine stressed the lack of customary law forbidding female governance. The Salic law was a creation of the 15th century, explaining retrospectively rather than causing female exclusion. It had a long history, traceable to the death of Louis X in 1316. During the first 300 years of the Capetian rule, uh, female succession was not uh, an issue. However, when Louis the four, uh, X died, he left a four years old daughter, uh, Jeanne, and a pregnant queen. His post-human son died shortly after his birth. Philip, brother of the defunct king, assumed regency, initially promising to revisit the succession when Jean came of age, but he later negotiated with his niece's maternal relatives, the Dukes of Burgundy, so that she renounced her claim to the throne and he made himself crown Philip V. Although in the first phases of the debate of the female ruling France, the Pisans strongly debated for it, However, by the end of this century, when the royal princess Anne of France became guardian of her brother, King Charles VIII, the situation worsened. She was not granted the official title of the regent due to reasons that showed the precarious position of female with the authority, owing to the change given to female possibilities within this period. Uh, Christine's excursion in the public realm, showing the female ability for governing that surpassed the courtly intrigue and concerned the nascent nation, is her critique of the attempted revolutions. <laughs> Although some historians consider it traditional, others viewed it as farsight. I think that here I try to put two similar stylistic points in, in, um, in images of these two noble women. Um, there may be similar, would maybe similar immediate out outcomes as neither of the two women was able to rule the euro old in France and became the facto regent as was even called the king and this was even understood as the facto king like by her uh, contemporaries, um, most notably Isabel Castile. However, these two um, processes had, I would say, different far-reaching consequences that could be seen that the outcomes that in England of the 16th century we start having queen regnants whilst in France only this semi-institutionalized regency in, in, in a form of a mother, so in female uh, 
was the outcome. So that would be more or less it. I, I hope I did not, uh, yeah, I guess it's the past 15 minutes, but I'm sorry about that. So um, we will then pass to um, Fedor uh, Veselov and move into another century, another climate. Yes. Uh, so I will try to share my presentation. Okay. Here it is. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. We'll do this and this and this. Yeah, okay. you So, uh, let me first express my deepest thanks uh, to the organizers of the conference for warm hospitality and careful understanding of little asks of its participants. For example, me asking to join this section except of the afternoon section. Sadly, I have a plane to St. Petersburg. However, I should start speaking about Alexander the Great, Ivan the Terrible, I think it's better to call him Ivan the Fourth, and Jinarchy. Uh, what I'm speaking about is the first letter of Tsar Ivan to Andrei Kurpsky. And uh, it is not only one of the most significant documents of Muscovite political world in the 16th century, but also an awesome example of literary talent of first Russian Tsar, whose encyclopedic mind constructs the basis for the ideal theory of the autocratic power, power using a great number of apothegms. And they are originating from a wide range of secular and ecclesiastical writings. And while speaking about the right to Tsar, who should put a bridle on a vice and evil people, Ivan insists on the thing that the Tsar power should function with a fear and prohibition to save souls of all people of his Tsardom. Uh, that is why this is evil when in the Tsardom different people rule in different towns on their own. He says, You've seen by your own eyes how Russia was devastated when in every town there were own chiefs and rulers. And after that, he includes the following aphorism, uh, which actually is the topic of my speech, uh, which is one of the most intriguing in the correspondence. War betide a man or husband. I would say that in Old Slavonic, uh, it's the same word for husband and for man. And the same thing with a woman and a wife. So, war betide a man who is ruled by a woman, war betide a town which is ruled by many people. So, what we are facing with uh, is what the connection between these two parts of aphorism. They are somehow disconnected. It's like we are missing uh, terzon comparationis, some third part. And uh, the Tsar himself states that this is a reference to some prophet. Uh, one should mention that Ivan IV, who was phenomenally educated, he had a memory like a sponge. And this is obvious from his letters, where he uses examples and ideas from a wide range of ecclesiastical, historical and literary sources. But he was a Tsar, not a scholar. He had no any idea to make a straight reference to his source, as we have too. So uh, this makes the search of, for sources of Ivan's intelligent aphorism uh, in his epistles even more complicated. Uh, Jakob Lurier in 1979 has suggested that verses from the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach, and Ecclesiastes were sources for the first and for the second parts of the aphorism. Uh, while the first part of the phrase is brilliantly explained, I have to say it's obvious that the second part has almost nothing in common. Uh, however, uh, in two 
uh, in 2019, Dmitry Bovanin suggested that the source for it was the text of Serbian Alexandrida, uh, which is Serbian Alexander Romans. Uh, it comes from the episode where young Alexander is disappointed by the Athenians, I mean citizens of Athens, who preferred to fight him instead of being peacefully subjugated. So Alexander says, war betide the land which is ruled by many people. Thus, this phrase of Alexander the Great seems more correct in terms of its sense and textual standard. What is interesting, this phrase from, uh, of Alexander, it is characteristic only for Serbian Alexandrina, not for all Greek text. We know I will just show this scheme of the literary history of Serbia, of Alexandria, of, uh, I mean, Romans of Alexander, starting from late antiquity and finishing in late medieval. So this is one of the most popular book in uh, all Middle Ages from Iceland to Mongolia. And um, uh, what we are going to discuss, me, <laughs> is that the whole phrase is based on the Serbian Alexandria direction. In the end of the Romans, when Alexander, after finishing on his, all his adventures, already stays at Babylon, uh, there starts the last chapter of this literary work about the Alexander's death. Uh, this part has characteristic interpolations with the short stories of, on more moral subjects. And among others, there is an episode about a wife who asked Alexander for a death penalty for her husband. Uh, that day, one woman came to Alexander and said, My husband is angry with me and blames me a lot. Alexander answered, A husband is a head for his wife. I cannot make a judgment on a husband in front of his wife. But she wanted Alexander to kill him, uh, to kill her husband, and she said, O oh, Tsar, while he beats me, he is not faithful to you. And Alexander said, You cannot make a judgment on your husband. In Mazadom, wives do not judge their husband. A war to a land which is ruled by a woman. A war betide the land which is ruled by a woman. God created a woman for childbearing, and a woman should be dependent on her husband. And after that, Alexander, after Alexander had said that, he ordered to cut off her tongue. Medieval times. Uh, this episode is also specific only for the particular Slavonic version. Only for Slavonic Alexandrina. We will find it in all uh, South Slavonic manuscripts and mainly in all Russian manuscripts, which we have more than uh, 100 and a half. Uh, of course, there are little differences in Alexander's speech, uh, which could be more or less widespread or shortened. Here you can see. In some Russian manuscripts, while one will find the exact analog of the first part of Iron's, Ivan's quotation. And in all Alexandrina copies, we have the so-called distertsum compartionis, uh, which uh, connects these two parts of Alexander's of um, Ivan uh, the Fourth aphorism. And actually, uh, it's obvious from the extensive explanation by Ivan himself after this aphorism. Uh, no, here is Ivan's letter and Alexander Romans, and uh, Ivan's explanation is here on the. Uh, lower side of the slide. Can't you see that power of many corresponds with the women thoughtlessness? As woman cannot decide what she wants, sometimes this or sometimes that. Likewise, many people, why the one wants this, the other wants that. That is why wishes and thoughts of different people are similar to women thoughtlessness. What was the context of the phrase in Serbian Alexandria? Uh, Dmitry Buanin also accentuated the affinity of the aphorism with another source, the uh, father and son talk about women's malice. Or war betide a town which is ruled by a woman, war, or war betide a home which is held by a woman, or war betide a husband who depends on a wife. In this century many men hold many towns, but they are managed by their wives. However, uh, the woman's malice is the main theme for the last chapter, for the last part of the Alexander Romans, if not the whole Romans. I mean Alexandrida, Serbian Alexandrida. According to Serbian Alexandrida, Alexander was killed because of a woman. Uh, mother of two of his warriors who wished to see her sons, missing them for years because of Alexander's campaigns. So she sent them a poison, and one of them poisoned, the Alexander, uh, poisoned Alexander, wishing to become Macedonian ruler himself. 
the more so, the discussed episode about the angry wife appears just after the Serbian editor of the romance starts to tell us about this conspiracy. Thus, the whole context of the episode is drama about the uh, women's malice. And this is very close to Ivan's explanation, who used the idea about the women power, not literary, but figuratively. So here, like a logical chain of all these uh, parts which formed this aphorism. War betide the man who is ruled by a woman, plus war betide the land which is ruled by a woman, plus the power of many corresponds with the woman thoughtlessness. So we have uh, war betide the town which is ruled by many people. And uh, what I'm speaking about is this is only, this is not literary. Uh, this is also explaining one, why Ivan attributes this aphorism to some prophet. He says prophet, uh, because if we will turn to uh, Jakob Fourier's idea that the first part of the phrase is taken from uh, Jesus ben Sirach, we will be confused to explain why Jesus ben Sirach is a prophet. He was not. And on the other hand, during the whole narration of Serbian Alexandrida, its protagonists died because of women. Alexander's father Philip died uh, because of one made by Peloponnesus Tsar, who was figuratively shot down by the beauty of Olympia, Alexander's mother and wife of Philip. Alexander cries over the graves of Troia and Greek heroes in Troia. And you know, Trojan war started because of a woman. And finally, Alexander himself died because of a woman. Uh, in all these cases, a known editor of medieval Serbian translation refers to Tsar Salomon and his Book of Wisdom, who is the most famous hero of the Bible, suffered because of a woman's beauty. And Solomon the wise said, O oh man, don't be shot down by the woman's beauty. And Solomon traditionally appeared among the prophetic tear uh, of the iconostasis in Russian churches uh, as early as the 15th century in Oregon. Moreover, even iconographically, Solomon is very close to Alexander in Middle Ages, because you can see here it is Alexander and Kentaurus, Kitavras in Slavonica. The same is here on the uh, Vasilyevsky gates in Novgorod Sofia Cathedral. Oh, I will show you. This is uh, the so-called Belgrade Alexandrida, which was lost uh, during the German bombing of Belgrade in uh, 1941. And here it is, we have just the same Tsar Solomon mural in the Church of the Assumption of the Mother of God. It's uh, Kovalevo Polony in Novgorod. So, and uh, you can see they are all deadlessness like. And this is very rare for iconography of a man in Middle Ages uh, Slavonic countries. So therefore, in my opinion, I will turn to my conclusions. The source for Ivan the Fourth aphorism was only Serbian Alexandrida, as I think, uh, Serbian Alexander Romans. Uh, the context of the, this phrase of this aphorism makes it obvious that it was not about actually critics of Ginarchy. Uh, Alexander's character in Serbian Romans and Ivan the Fourth in life. They, had, they both had more or less successful diplomatic relations with the sovereign queens. We have to remember at least Queen of Amazons and Queen of Ethiopia, Kandaka, no, she's little there, of course, in Alexandrida, and uh, equally known correspondence of Ivan IV with the Queen Elizabeth I of England. Uh, for Ivan, it was just to strengthen his rhetorics about the harmfulness of anarchy and uh, or regime when ruled many people. The plot of women's malice was typical for late medieval mind. And there should be only one step to connect the perversity of rule of many with the perversity of uh, rule of a woman. And this step could be made if you remember, as I think Ivan IV remembered, Alexander Romans, uh, Serbian Alexandrida, in which uh, on the one hand, one will find an episode where Alexander criticizes Athenian democracy. And on the other hand, uh, all the Romans tells about the danger of women and presents a perfect example in its finishing part just before the dramatic death of Macedonian Tsar. And finally, this is not about critics of democracy. Uh, Ivan based his idea of ideal sovereign on the Byzantine imperial model. 
and which was actually, as Vladimir Waldenberg named it, a uh, democratic monarchy. And it is more about critics of chaos and disorganization when the one wants this and the other wants that. And this is not about misogyny or anti-feminism also. As in Alexander Romans, we find very touching depictions, expressions of Roxana, Alexander's wife, and Olympiad, Alexander's mother, their love and their virtues. It is more about tries to depict impersonal evil in the late medieval context. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> And we have 10 minutes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. All good. Okay. Um, questions? I. I must bet first where you're thinking of them. Come on. <laughs> uh, okay, Nina. Well, I have one general and one specific question. The general one would be that we've seen from these papers and from the discussion previously between Professor Monter and Professor Dimopoulou uh, that there have been many uh, naturally general arguments against women in power. There have been some theoretical arguments for women in power, like Melina mentioned, that Christine de Pizan gave. Mm -hmm. But from what I've gathered here, there have only been practical arguments for concrete women in power. So a general question to all of you who have researched these subjects, have, has anyone ever... Uh, ran into an argument, it doesn't have to be a legal solution, but at least someone uh, corroborating that it's all right for women to take the throne, to, to rule, to be a regent, anything of the sort, something that is generalizing in the case of a concrete woman who, was, who had taken or who was trying to take power. And there's just an unrelated brief question to Fyodor. Could you maybe elaborate on the connection between Alexander and Solomon in the iconography that you've presented? Thank you. Yes. Well, I'll answer the second one first. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the question. Actually, the thing about the uh, iconographic research between Solomon and Alexander is what I just got preparing this paper. And so uh, I, I cannot, you know, extensively express you about the um, main roots of this connection. But what I think is this is about a young man who becomes a czar and he brings a power into his hands, being very young. And that's why uh, he afterwards depicted Birdless, just to emphasize that he became a great ruler being young. And uh, of course, speaking about Alexander, this is a greatest tragedy in, uh, I think, uh, the whole world literature is about uh, to take all the world and to die young. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, this is really tragedy, tragedy, um, like a subject for any tragedy. It's, it's very, you know, soothing. And uh, so I think this is it. And it's interesting that iconography of Alexander and iconography of Solomon changes in the 17th century Russia when Russia turns to a modern time. So from medieval ages. And uh, we can, for example, uh, meet <laughs> iconography of Alexander, iconography of Solomon with the bird uh, just in the end of the 17th century when Russia moves west. <laughs> so that is it. Um, I'm simply, uh, you know, again, for the, the central question you've asked is, uh, 
it's indeed a, uh, a tricky one to answer. I'm, I'm, I'm searching my musty memory for this. And um, Christine de Pizan, what I know is, is different complicating problems. Christine de Pizan was a contemporary of uh, Giovanna of Naples. They overlap by a great deal. And um, Christine had nothing positive to say about jo Joanna of Naples. Um, after all, the problem was that the first stigma on Giovanna was the murder of her first husband. Um, so that's a specific, and that's a specific drawback. That's kind of the reverse of your question. Um, and, and yet, um, Boccaccio's story and Boccaccio, uh, I don't think had heard of Christine. Uh, so the, uh, but Boccaccio is the first and for a long time, the real only, um, positive set of commentaries. He has a lot to say about what Giovanna did and it's nearly all positive. So, um, in fact, I, I would even go so far as to say that in the 18th century, when you have the enlightenment principles of rational discussion of a lot of things, well, they've had both the age of Voltaire and so on has had, and Montesquieu for that matter, uh, have had uh, female rule in you know their collective past. They know it's happened, um, but I'm unaware of any enlightenment treatise that actually picks up and works from Boccaccio. Um, so Western literature um, has a, until somebody finds or <laughs> invents a really good enlightened manuscript demonstrating the positive features of putting a woman in charge of a state. Um, the fact that when you're having a, uh, ugly and not very successful wars, um, uh, you know, the, 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 well, uh, the, the theoretical argument that I think I would expect some such author to have made was that um, a, putting a woman instead of a man in charge of a state government significantly decreases the possibilities of an aggressive war. But I think uh, without being too uh, completely, well, in, in so far as I could say gender dominated, you know, uh, point of view, um, if you want to avoid real ugly foreign policy, um, that this is probably a, um, a wise move to make a woman is preferable that way. Um, but I don't know the literature, I can't say <laughs> So, uh, do we have any, any, uh, yes, Stefanovic. No, I just wanted to put a few points toward the question of Professor Kirschliani in the general one. Well, I think we should bear in mind that there is um, two uh, major points, so to say the states before Christianity and the states after Christianity. With the coming of the Christianity, the situation changed dramatically towards the female rights in every possible aspect. But even with the societies before Christianity, so to say, it's um, not so easy to shape the general model, neither for the ancient Near Eastern state, either with or without Egypt. It's a quite different situation, but we have in ancient Egypt in the Neo-Assyrian Empire, for example, or the city-states in the Levant, what we have uh, in the classical world with the Greek city states, with the Roman Empire, Hellenism, and so on. So it's really hard to, to have um, a general framework. So that's all. Zachary. Oh. Yeah, okay, so you can. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't talk about a, a treaty that or, or that kind of goes for specifically for women's government and you know against males but maybe the most that you can get uh, out of it is that a woman is accepted as uh, um, 
heir to the throne once the male inheritance line goes defunct. And you have something like that in, in Spain with Sir Patidas. I think that's like maybe the most that we could expect in the Christian world, no less. Okay. So um, re regarding this idea of a theoretical model for female rulership, there is one interesting example um, in, in the Orthodox world, and this would be a question on the Georgian participants uh, in the audience, uh, because, um, it, you know, I know this is a Byzantinist, um, there are uh, legends in the, in the Byzantine uh, context about the apostles being sent to different parts of the, of the, of the Mediterranean world um, to convert people to Christianity. And so each apostle gets a specific place to go to, right? Like Andreas gets sent to uh, Constantinople and so, so on and so forth. Um, uh, and actually, um, the Virgin Mary, in some versions of these stories, is supposed to go to Iberia, to Georgia. Um, she doesn't get sent there, um, uh, and she ends up going to Mount Athos, and then you have this whole legend about uh, her being, uh, you know, the first woman and should be the only woman at Mount Athos, whatever. Um, and actually, that, um, that lot is given to Nino, um, and Nino actually uh, is the, the patron saint of Georgia, right, for... Um, having evangelized Georgia with 12 female virgins. And then when, um, when Tamar becomes a ruler in the Middle Ages, I know that there are some references to Tamar sort of um, being, uh, being able to be a ruler because you have this, um, uh, this apostolic tradition of, of Nino proselytizing Georgia. But I, I, I only know about it sort of secondhand, and that would be a question on sort of the the Georgian specialists in the room who are presenting later. Or they can answer you during the break. <laughs> <laughs> because I think my watch says we're there. Thank you all very much. Uh, this is indeed a peculiar experience to have to uh, moderate something that covers about 2,000 years from, <laughs> so we're good. Okay, okay. we broke it, we were on the uh, uh, pause between now and the next session, yes. Yes, so a, a pause until 12.45. La séance levée. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>